Okay, welcome back everyone. And today we're gonna do something different. We're not gonna deal with armatures. We're gonna go into uh, changing rendering. Um, well, for the most part, what we've done in rendering is something called forward rendering, where we're just rendering everything one at a time to our main frame buffer. Uh, in the past, uh, probably like 20, 30 videos ago, we explored FBOs, uh, frame buffer objects. And we create a frame buffer object so we can do color picking. So that, so what that did is we, we drew everything to our custom buffer. Then at the very end, we um, render that on the main buffer. So it was kind of a two-step process. That was kind of like the very basic beginnings of something called deferred rendering. Uh, what, I have, what I have up on the screen is an image of what deferred rendering kind of is. So the idea is that we're going to build a, an FBO, and we're going to save all the information out. Uh, like here's all the colors. This is actually the death buffer and this is the normals. So the idea is that you're going to just do all the rendering on our custom um, on our custom uh, frame buffer and each component that we're saving is a texture that we can actually uh, access later on when we do the second pass. Uh, that, that's another term you might hear. It's uh, you have uh, multi-pass rendering. So this is what we're going to be doing. We're going to start doing multi-pass rendering. Now we're just you know sometimes to, to just to get one object rendered, we have to render it like multiple times. Um, the idea for deferred rendering is for lighting. Um, the, I, the thing is, you just like here's an example. You have your colors, your death, and your your normals. When you're rendering, you just render the information. Right, and you completely render it all out. Everything's nice and related. And then when you do the second pass, you then take these three textures and then use the information. Um, and then you can do lighting. You can do like a lot of complex lighting that way. Um, the reason that makes sense is because you have images that overlap. See, like this, the background, uh, the the floor. These um, these shapes overlap it. So that means if you were going to do re light, uh, forward rendering on lighting and we l render the floor, so we waste a lot of time doing a lot of lighting calculations on the floor that, that ends up getting um, replaced by um, these shapes that have their own lighting. And then if there's more overlap, you just end up wasting a lot of CPU time. So if we just, just save all the information that we need and then start dealing with lighting and other more complicated um, effects, um, it would actually save you a lot more time, uh, like shadows. Uh, if you, if we, at some point we want to explore shadows, we need to do deferred rendering. Um, more complicated lighting, like if you want to do like 10 or 15 light sources and, and lights bouncing around all over the place, that requires deferred uh, lighting. Um, uh, the process of deferred lighting we need for post effects. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna explore pixelated post effects today. At the very end, after we're all said and done, we're gonna do maybe a post effect uh, shader uh, just for fun, so you guys get to have a little something uh, at the end. Because this is mostly just kind of system work, and you know we're going to explore uh, just frame buffers again, just a little bit. We're gonna quick quick review really quick, and then just kind of go into it and uh, improve what we had before. So that's what deferred rendering, and that's where we're going to probably go in the direction a lot in the, in the series um, to get more complicated effects. Uh, one of the effects that I want to create, I need deferred rendering. Uh, that would be in the next video. Uh, it would be kind of a force field effect. Um, so I needed I need access to the death buffer. So to get the death buffer information as a texture, I need to have a custom frame buffer set up, and it's a, it becomes a two-pass process. So... Let's quick look at uh, uh, what we're gonna do first. So this is not the right. One. So here you go. I refreshed it because uh, I needed to change. Now, when we left off with FBOs, an FBO, in case you forgot, is you know just it's just a frame. It's the frame we're, we're rendering to. We're we're, uh, we're drawing a giant texture, all the single pixels, all the pixels that's on the screen. This is one single frame instance of a frame buffer, basically. And when you set up a frame buffer, it's just like a um, VAO. It's kind of like a vect uh, vertex array object. It's the same thing. You have this over uh, this kind of like st structure, uh, struct object, and then it has the individual pieces. Where uh, VAO, you kind of have your index, and then you have your uh, position buffer, your normal buffers. 
Frame buffers are the same thing, if you remember from, from the previous video. Um, the only difference is, is that you have a frame buffer, and then inside of it you have up to 16 color buffers that you can apply, and you can customize how, how the pixels are stored. And then you have the depth buffer. And the depth buffer is kind of like the index buffer. It's kind of the thing that kind of ties everything together. So if we're writing to a bunch of uh, buffers, uh, to a bunch of color buffers, that depth buffer will then determine what gets replaced based on what being what's being overlapped. So if you if you want if you want to do that kind of that translation, a VAO, you have the index which kind of ties in all the attri uh, vertex attributes. Um, it's kind of similar kind of way, but not really. The depth buffer does that for frame buffers. Like I said, it's it's a way to know what overlaps what. So this box kind of draws over the grid. Without the depth buffer, that wouldn't work very well. Like the grid might be over the box or vice versa, or, or certain faces might be behind the grid and other faces be in front of the grid. It's really wacky. But with the depth buffer, we have that control. So when we left off, we, ha we had this, right? We had, um, we lost the, the, the ability of anti-aliasing. Uh, when we did our custom frame buffer. So this is kind of where we left off. Since then, I've learned uh, there's a feature called multi-sampling. So this way we can set up our frame buffers like how they're supposed to render, and, and they automatically have anti-aliasing. So um, let's see. So this is kind of like our old code. Now, this is actually not old code. This is actually brand new. Uh, I probably should mention that there's some code changes to fungi uh, in shader, renderer, I needed to do some changes to renderer, um, quad, I did some small little changes, uh, GL has a couple changes. Uh, the main big changes, uh, we have a new function, uh, RGBA array, other than just RGBA, uh, RGB array. It just adds in the alpha state. Um, I we're not using it for this lesson, I just, I just threw it in there because I needed it for some prototyping, which end up not being used. But um, yeah, that that's in there. I just say that because it can be useful to have a RGBA sometimes. Uh, the biggest change is the FBO. Uh, the the biggest change really is that the FBO uh, object in our gl.js file before it was a bunch of static functions, uh, and now it's not. Now it's kind of you have to make an instance FBO, and the whole thing is treated as a as a struct builder. Um, I just it made it easier to um, made the API easier to use. So you just make an instance of it and it kind of creates an FBO. You have to you have to, go to, you have to call the create function with the width and height. And if you don't have the width and height, it automatically knows the width and height of your canvas. So it's kind of all automatic for you. Um, it, I think the previous version did do it like this, but the API was different. It was a bunch of structs that you had to call them separately. Um, having this built as, a, as an instance class and then having... Um, FBO kind of like built into it or like this kind of like this kind of like the placeholder of the FBO struct that we're building so like when you create we create the struct um, and then every single function uh, that's in there that used to be a struct or a, a static can be chained very easily um, so like in this instance I create the instance of FBO I say okay well on FBO create my new um, structure I want to create uh, a texture buffer, a texture color buffer, set, set it at the color uh, position zero, create me a death buffer, and then finalize and give me an apply a name to it. And there's our my, our, our FBO renderer. So that big th this is what would, was before, but the API now has been improved. So if you want if you want go to GitHub, get the new FBO. Uh, it, like I said, it's easier to use uh, than the previous version, um, but there's only like two new functions in here, or three new functions. Um, we'll go. We'll actually go through it because they're important. So that's a regular simple FBO. Uh, now, if you want to do multi-sampling, right? If you want to improve it, now we got a couple. We got these some user new functions. So we have our create, but now we're going to do our multi-sample color buffer function, and then we have a death buffer equals true, which has like a true and false state. Um, and here you'll see that I'm actually creating another uh, frame buffer. And so, so uh, but this one's a texture color buffer, it has no uh, death buffer at all to it, because you don't really need to if you don't want to, and then you finalize. 
Um, and then I did some changes, I think, to materials and shaders. That's the ch uh, So this way I can uh, easily apply um, the textures to the materials because I want to be able to apply the, mat the textures to materials. Um, so when we're rendering, the materials automatically apply it to the shaders because uh, I think before we used to apply it to the shaders, but the thing is we're dealing with multiple textures. Um, if there's problems, it's actually better to have it, have it the shader, the materials apply it to the shaders during runtime because they, when we swap back and forth between different objects, um, things just start not rendering right. So I figured it out was that I need to apply, the, I need to reapply these textures to the shaders every frame, uh, every time we draw. So that's why now materials kind of handles our textures instead of the shaders themselves. So. Now you might you, you might be asking why do I have two frame buffers? Well, to get multi sampling to work, I you need to create. Um, so if I go to here, multi sampler, we need to create. Uh, like, uh, let me open up texture buffer, the texture buffer, so you can kind of see the difference. So in tradition, in the last video, we would just create a texture, and then we apply it as a frame buffer. So this way we can. So uh, the, the system would draw to that buffer, save it in the texture, and then later on we can take that texture and then use it for rendering. So we can do post effects. That's one of the things we did in the very beginning when we created FBOs. We did post effects. We will do blurring and things like that. So it's all the same. But because we have a straight texture, we lose that frame buffer ability to multi-sample, to kind of smooth things out a little bit. Um, because it's just writing directly right into it and doing no processing whatsoever. So as a replacement, we have multi-sample color buffer. Now, we can't do textures anymore. Um, I have to maybe research it some more, but to do multi-sampling, we can do textures, but it's a two-step process. Um, so I, I, did, I did research, but I couldn't find maybe a better way to do this, but it has to be a two-step process. So the first step is that we're going to create a, a um, a render buffer. So we just create a render buffer. We bind it, kind of like everything else, and and then we just use this new function, which which tells it to as a multi sample because there's a function without multi sample uh, that I think we, we use for our death buffers because our death buffers are also just a render buffer. So render buffer multi sample, and this one just render buffer storage, or you know multi sample. So it's almost the same. Like I said, it's the same thing as creating the death buffer. Um, the only difference is we're doing the multi-sampling, and you put the sample size, and it's set to four. Now, there's a thing I try to put a, a different values to see how they change, and they just don't work. The only only value I can get working with multi-sampling is four. I don't know if it's a bug in Chrome or I'm doing something wrong, but the only way to get multi-sampling to work is by placing the value four. So I have it set as a default four. So all you really have to do is just give it uh, a new um, attribute name and which um, which color attachment you want it to, to add it to. So you just like 0 through 15. So you pass in how many samples to do. Four, it'll smooth things out. Uh, the data is, uh, I forget what this means. Like I know it's RGBA, but I think that's 8 bits. I think that allows alpha. Or I, forget, I forget what this is. It's just the way how the data is stored. Um, and then you give it the width and the height of the texture. Uh, that you want it to be, so it's it's the full um, frame, which the create function kind of gets for you, kind of saves it for you. So frame width, frame height is put into our FBO structure, so we kind of know what it is. And pointer is the main pointer to the frame buffer that we're building. Um, once you set up the data size and how it it is, then you kind of just attach it to the uh, our um frame buffer. So this this is the function we use. So you know it, it we say it's a frame buffer with you know what color attachment it is. Um we're telling it it's a render buffer and we're giving it the GPU pointer to it. And then on top of that we are saving the which attachments we currently have because we need to enable them um on when we finalize. It it helps improve uh, certain things. I think before I wasn't doing this. So finalize did get changed a little bit. Finalize probably is up here. 
So the only difference is that this this little extra bit is just turn on uh, the because we're writing to it the uh, draw buffers and we just pass in the array of which um, attachments uh, color attachments we have turned on. So that's what we're doing here. We're just that color attachment we put it to the array and that when we finalize that array gets pushed out and those get set up just right. And that's how we do multi sampling. And then the death buffer is the, is the same, like I said. But the only difference is it has a state. It is a, is a multi-sample. Um, now, the thing is, if you're going to multi-sample the color attachment, you have to multi-sample the death buffer as well. Uh, if you don't, it crashes. It, it doesn't work. Like It needs it needs both to be multi-sampled. So that's, that's what the change, that's the only change to death buffer really is. So this is without multi-sampling and this is with multi-sampling sampling. and there's a uh, really no change to be honest you just tell it the the number and the thing is the number I hard coded it because I can't do more than four or I can't do any number other than four but this might change in the future once I figure out what's wrong with the, the sample size but um, just keep that in mind that that's hard coded but it should be the same value that you use for your color um, buffers so if you might, if you're multi sampling color attachments, you have to sam multi sample your death buffer as well, and then everything else kind of falls the same. And the last thing, the so so that means this is one we're going to render to, and then you, and this is just our t regular text color buffer that we already looked at, and um, let me turn off the phone. Sorry about that. Um, so now we have two render buffers. Now the reason the, here's the reason why we have two render buffers. Um, since we're doing multi sampling, we can't use uh, render buffers um, in our shaders. We can't access them. They're basically not readable. So you have to build another render buffer. This one with a texture uh, render buffer, basically. Like that's what we're doing here. It's just the FBO color texture, and that's all it is. And it's it's set up the exact same way as this one, with the exact same size of the canvas. But then at the very end, when we're doing our um, post loop, we have to call blit. F our new function called blit. FB we we pass in our renderer and we pass in our color text, and that function right here is the static. It's our FBO read and FBO write. So the multi-sampler one is what we're going to be reading from. And our color texture is the one we're going to write to. And, in, and right here, all we do is clear out our the buffer we're writing to, the, 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 the frame texture. And then we use the function called blit frame buffer. This is what's part of the context. And all we have to do is basically say from 000, zero, zero like the, or the, the, the first pixel, to the last pixel, that's the, how much data we're going to read from our multi-sample frame. And we're going to write to our texture the exact same amount. So basically all we're doing is copying all the pixel information from our multi-sample uh, frame and we're going to put it into our texture frame. And then we just unbind it. So this way we can get we have we can multi-sample and then if we want to use it as a texture, we can then use the blit function to copy it over to a different frame. So this becomes like a multi-step process to do multi-sampling. So that's that's like so that, so when you're done rendering on post render, because because uh, this is what we had before when we're doing um, uh, when we're doing multi. Uh, when we're doing post effect rendering, we have a pre render and a post render. So before we render, you know, we do some things, and then um, after we render, we do some things. So like when we're done, we act we deactivate the uh, the currently active frame buffer, which is um, uh, the, 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 this one FBO, the multi sample one. Uh, the clear function. I, I did originally we would uh, set the frame buffer and then clear it. I, I I updated the clear function to automatically set it for us, 
just to make it easier. So instead of doing two function calls, I do one. So here's clear. Uh, because normally we would clear it and then we we kind of unbind it. So I can kind of say, do we unbind it? Yes or no? By default, we do unbind it. Um, but if we don't, which is set to false, it leaves it bound. So so I clear, so I bind it, our, our custom frame buffer. I clear the, the color and its depth buffers. And then I choose not to unbind it. So this way it's automatically bound. So I don't have to do, like I said, I don't have to do two function calls. It just says, so I know that's a little not clear. That's why I put a note that I'm not unbinding it. Uh, so this way it's I save myself one extra function call, you know, trying to make it efficient. Sometimes the mo um, I, someone, uh, I was talking to someone recently, and I said the most efficient things are usually the, the most unreadable. So, so that's why I said this is not very clear what's happening. It goes against common programming convention that you have a function that does not, you know, does not say what it's doing. Like it's like like you wouldn't realize that it actually left it unbinding. So that's you know it's it, it becomes it down it comes down to how you want to do it. If you want to do a two step process or like two function calls, or maybe call this um, bind and clear, that make probably makes more sense. Um, so like if you make a function like say bind and clear then that function makes sense of what it's doing so anyone who reads it understands it but the way, since I built it this way it's a little unclear um, what's happening um, maybe I should change it now that I'm thinking about it maybe I should to make it nice and clear what happens but if you're writing this yourself go ahead and do it that way um, don't need that I just comment that out uh, and like I said, and then when we're done, we do the blit, and then we tell our render to prepare our next thing, which is the quad. Remember, when we're done rendering everything, we do one more render is to a giant quad that that encompasses the entire frame, and we draw. And that's it. And that's our multi-sample thing. If I go to here, so now you see the textures are a little jagged. Now if I zoom back in, the lines are anti-aliased. They're nice and smooth. So by using multi, by just adding that multi-sample, we can really smooth out our um, rendering. So that's our multi-sampling with FBOs. I keep going back to the wrong window. Now we're going to have some fun. Um, now we're going back to the old rendering because I didn't want to deal with death buffers. Uh, but we can't. Um, I just made this simpler uh, idea because I want to because now I want to actually access the death buffer. So here's another one. Uh, we're going to create. We're going to create a texture buffer, and we're going to create a death buffer, and we're going to finalize it. And we're going to apply those two to our deferred um, material. If I click fresh, go to there. Out there fresh. Now we got back to jaggedy because I'm not doing the two-step process. I'm just going to stick with um, a more simpler, non-multi-sampling version. Um, uh, ideally, I th you I haven't tried it yet, but if you just create like a, a the like when we're creating the, the texture, you create a texture um, death buffer as well and I think blit would automatically copy the death, death buffer information as well I'll copy whatever from one to the other automatically I believe so you can still do multi um, multi sampling if you want um, but right now I'm just uh, I'm just not bothering with it right now I just want to keep it nice and simple so we got our text buffer and we got our, our text we got our text color buffer and we got our text death buffer so if we go into our shader uh, which would be our deferred renderer. I, I make a new, f I made a new folder called deferred. So I'm going to end up putting all my shaders that are related to deferring, because these might not work very well. Some of these and special shaders will probably need to be created to, uh, to handle the new rendering type that we're doing. So uh, nothing's different. Uh, as you can see, the only difference is in my uniforms. I'm setting up a uh, buffer color and buff de death, so this way I can actually access it. Um, got some functionality here. There's not too much that's going on in our vertex shader. Uh, we're just going to copy over our UVs and our positions. Not, like I said, there's nothing to it. Most of our 
most of the fancy work is in here in our uh, fragment shader. So here's our shader information. And one of the first things we need to do is we need to um, figure out what the coordinates are. So every fragment you have access to its x, y, z position on the screen. So we know what an x, y position is. But all these values are in, um, whatchamacallit, uh, in uh, floats. So even though these are screen values, um, so yeah, so we got the screen values. And we also have another function that exists called texture size. So if you want to get the size of the texture, because we kind of need it for, for something, but it's not, it's not at the very beginning. It's near the end. We're only dealing with pixels, uh, but we're going to do pixelating. We need to know how big our texture is, which is the canvas size. Um, so the thing is, these are in floats but they need to be integers. So we're just going to convert these into integers. And the reason why we're doing these as integers is because we're going to use a function called text, textual fetch. And textual fetch, as opposed to texture, the, the function texture, I don't think we have it in here anymore. Text, the texture function uses UV, and it's a value between 0 and 1. To, to smooth things, like the thing is, if you're using that and you don't have like perfect precision with um, floats, you not get the you not get the most perfect pixel every time you're running. So things might be slightly off. You you might you won't even notice it. You won't even care. But if you use Texel Fetch, it get grab the exact pixel that you want. That's why it's an integer. So since we know the exact pixel that we are going to draw or that we're currently drawing, because we're drawing this is like a, this is kind of like a post effect thing that you could, that makes more sense. We're just going to grab the exact pixel of that texture because so this way it's a one to one match of our textures to our screen. So that's why we're using text uh, textual fetch. So we just give it our texture and then we give it our integer position, the x y position of the pixel that we want. And we do the same. Uh, you don't have to do and um, depth. And if you get depth, the only value. The only value that exists is the first one. It's X, R, or S, whatever whatever you want to grab. But or you can just do R too. But um, uh, R, the other colors aren't stored or are, are like zeros. So if you want, to, if you want to grab depth information, you have to grab the X value in the texture thing. And um. Let's see what else. So right now we're just rendering our our color texture, the main texture. So if you want, we can actually render our death buffer. So so you guys can actually see what the death buffer death buffer looks like. So like I said, the death and we use a func there's a function here called linear death that kind of um converts it. Uh, I'm trying to remember what the the death value is like somewhere between zero and one, if I believe. But then you kind of need to convert it into um, something else, uh, like somewhere between lin uh, the near and far. Um, there's two fun there's two uh, e uh, equations I found. This one works okay. It doesn't do a great job of it. Uh, I, this might be for a different purpose. Like this creates a value between. Uh, Actually, no, I'm sorry. I think the death, I'm sorry, the death that's in the texture is actually probably the real death. That's um, that the, the Z position of that pixel. And this kind of converts it into a 0 to 1 um, value. So this, so we have a value between 0 and 1. And then by using that new death value, we can, can just put it into our XYZ positions for our colors or RGB positions. Oh, my God. Now if I click Refresh... Now you see everything's black and, and white, or grayscale, actually. So the f well, the further away you are, the lighter things become. So the, the, what one means, you're like at the maximum distance away from the camera. And the, uh, like I said, in the death buffer, so if I get to zero, it gets black. That means I'm as close as I possibly can to the camera. So it's perfectly black. So that's we're just representing the depth distance between zero and one in a color fashion. So we kind of debug things. So you can kind of see, like the corner is a little darker than the face, like over here in the face. I don't know if you can tell. 
that's because that's closer to the camera than that is. So it's it's we're able to kind of determine what's closer to to, to your eye than what isn't. Got to stop doing that. Now, if we wanted to test or or debug our our death, we can have like this uh, little thing. So if we just test it and say it's less than four, kind of like halfway point. We're gonna color things red. So if I refresh, as you can see, I'm gonna call this kind of a representation of what is within that range. So we're like one, like uh, forty percent distance away, I guess. Now the thing is that that's a little funky. It's not very accurate. Like uh, the way it's set up, that's why I said there's like I had I found managed to find two equations. Um, so this function doesn't to me does not seem to work very very well. So if I comment that out, and I take this one, right? So this one um, converts it to a normalized device space, which is negative one to one. And then this takes the the near and far, which I, I made as constants, and this is our, this is our real near and far. If I were to put zero point one in here, it actually screws this up. It makes things really worse. So that might be part of the problem. Like this equation for uh, to set up death cannot handle um, sub one uh, values of near. So that's what kind of that's that's why it has to be one. Else, it really screws up. Um, and this equation actually does a really good job of actually um, converting it into uh, an actual value uh, that we can really use. Um, as you can see, it probably works better if I have the, not using the death buffer for rendering, for refresh. Now you see where the, all the red I'm drawing that's being drawn? I'm saying if only if the death is less than four, make it the color red. So everything that's red, the depth is less than four. That means the distance from the camera center to wherever these pixels are on the screen, they're below that depth. Now, the camera is actually four units away from origin. So the red line, the red drawing actually stops at four. Uh, Let's see, if I go into fungi, and here it is. I'm setting the camera as a distance of four. Uh, that's how far away it is. So that second, that second equation I found, or that second math sample, does the best job of converting um, all that normalized data into something that we can really use very easily. So it's, like it's perfect. It's four units away. So at some point, I might turn this equ that equation, uh, this stuff, into a function that we're probably going to be reusing a lot in um, future um, videos. Um, where I'm hard coding, I'm hard coding near and far. Um, you might want to make that uh, dynamic, depending on uh, how you have your program set up. But like I said, for me, I'm mostly I'm, I'm never going to change the near and far of my pr uh, projection matrix. And this is a projection matrix. Rem uh, uh, in case you don't remember, it's actually in the camera. So if we go to camera, orbit, you know, we, c we can set up our near and far. And then when we create, uh, we use a perspective uh, math to create our projection matrix. And the, the f field of view is 45 degrees. The near is 0 0.1, and 100 is our far value. So that's uh, that's what's being that's why I inserted it in here as constants. So like I said, this is probably the best if you want to use it. I, I probably suggest using that. I don't I can't remember was some forum post someone suggested using that. Uh, there's like two or three other ones I found that were really bad. I oops, I clicked delete by accident, and um, it just I just couldn't get the values working just right for myself. So this 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 one so far is the best. Um, these two lines of code are the best uh, to get the right death value that you c we can use in, in mathematics. So now we're going to have some fun. Now that we have uh, deferred uh, rendering work running, 
we're going to pixelate the entire screen. We're going to literally pixelate it. So I'm going to make the, each pixel size uh, about seven pixels big. So every pixel will be seven pixels big. And I take the the, the fragment co coordinate that we calculated up here, and I do a modulus of that size. So I'm always going to be between 0 and 7 for y and x. And if one, uh, if either one is 0, I want to draw black with an alpha state of 3, of 30%. If the, if the, the pixel we're drawing is not an even divi uh, divisible, uh, divisible by 7, basically if it's not every other p seventh pixel on the screen, do a little bit more math. So we're going to subtract whatever the remainder is from x and y, and then we'll use that to actually fetch the pixel that we want. So we need to convert to integer because uh, text fetch requires integers. It can't take floats. So like I said, we're just taking the remainder. So if it's 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 greater than zero, then there's a remainder value. There's like two or three or four. So this way, we're always going to try to grab um, the same pixel. So even though, so we, so we just grab the f first pixel of every group of seven. So it just makes things look kind of pixelated. And we're drawing a grid on top of that. So if I refresh, now our whole world is now completely pixelated. And we got that little grid in there to kind of make it uh, look kind of neat. Um, if you don't want the grid, you can just comment out this stuff that actually draws the grid and just draw the pixelated portions of it. Now it's a pi the weird pixelated world. And uh, you can always make it bigger too. So you can just say, okay, I want to make it 10. Make the p each pixel larger. Now it's a more heavy to see pixelated world. I think this might look r better, um, you know, if you have like a full render. Uh, scene. Um, but again, I still kind of like it better with the grids. Quick refresh. So uh, to me, I was playing around with it. I think seven was good. Uh, if we want, you can do maybe like three. I haven't tried three. Make the pixels really tiny. That looks pretty neat. You can really make out the, the scene a lot better of what's going on. And you still kind of got that weird grid thing. But I think 7 looked the best just for this scene specifically. You still got that heavy pixelated look. But it looks kind of neat with the grid. It's kind of hard to tell. Like I said, a fully rendered screen will look a lot better. But there you go. We do, we do, we, so we got deferred rendering. Uh, we got the starts of deferred rendering working. We got multi-sampling so we can smooth things out. And... Uh, we learned how to kind of read and use the death buffer a little bit. The next video, we're going to do a lot of death buffer. Um, that's the reason why I got this um, deferred rendering working uh, a lot better just the second time around. And um, you know, we got pixelation. We got a, another post effect. Uh, I, I made this post effect uh, this morning. It was kind of a, it took me a while to figure out how to go about it because I was using UVs. Then I started realizing I don't have to use UVs. I'm using all these int, uh, ints. And the math makes it a lot easier to use ints. Uh, so yeah, so using ints to me was a lot easier than using the UV values and um, like uh, I just should say the ints. It's using the actual frag coordinates. It made it easier than using the UV values. UV values are, are not perfect, so the grid, um, the grid lines weren't perfect. Some some lines were thicker than others. It was kind of really bad. So, uh, but like I said, since I'm doing this is a post effect. Um, I can actually kind of get away using um, the the actual pixel on the screen to uh, draw out the all the all the grids. So it worked out pretty well. Uh, this is a pretty neat effect. I, I'm happy I kind of managed to figure this out on my own. Um, you know, you, I might maybe use this in the future for fun. Um, you know, like uh, I guess uh, some games like they, they blur the background and then put like a UI in the front. I'm thinking maybe I'll do something like this. I'll pixelate the entire world with a grid and then put the UI in front like a, like an inventory or something. So this way you might be like, why is the back all pixelated? Why is it weird like that? Um, so yeah, that, that like I said, that might be kind of fun to kind of just add into, into a game. I don't know. I'm, I, just, I like to play around. 
So that'd be it for this video. Uh, next video will hopefully will happen soon. I just need to finish prototyping it. I, I did Twitter about it. It's, uh, um, if you guys haven't realized I have a Twitter, um, I'm doing a lot of cool things. I'm posting links to, uh, great stuff. Uh, I found this, uh, this morning. It was, it's a really cool, uh, shader. This is really awesome. Uh, but look, but it you can change it. It's really neat. This is a really awesome, uh, and it's, and it shows you that each shader. So every time you change it, it kind of changes the code. Um, like this, like I said, this is really awesome. Like this is a really freaking awesome shader I just found this morning. I was looking on how to do grids, and and I just found this. Um, like I said, this morning I was I found like the UV UV grids, and that just wasn't working right, but. I managed to figure something out on my own. Sometimes you need to f look at someone else's code to kind of get an idea of where to, to start and where to go. And then sometimes if you have enough knowledge, you can go further than the previous person uh, did. So like I said, this is awesome. Um, I don't know. Someday I want to take this apart and see how this works because it looks really, really neat. Um, but yeah, if you guys uh, like, if you guys want to follow me on, on, on Twitter, like I said, I will I actually do post a bunch of things. Uh, I like so code samples that I find uh, like progress. You know this this is going to be our next uh, video. Uh, it's going to be about this. We're going to use the death buffer to uh, to calculate the intersections. And um, yeah, that's it. So uh, please like and subscribe. I've gotten uh, tons of extra new subscribers. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I got some Patreons that came in. Thank you very much. I appreciate any any. Uh, any donations um so please like and subscribe if you have any friends have them subscribe to me too because like i said i'm working to get up a little plaque from google and um yeah if you have any questions please ask i've been helping a lot of people this week uh people are sending me comments and messages now hopefully i've been helping you guys out with uh, your answers um uh, yeah so yeah uh yeah if you want to see up-to-date stuff twitter uh, again, like, like, and subscribe. That's right. Uh, see you guys in the next lesson.